Um, I'm Lindsay Bremner. I'm the PI on monsoon assemblages. Um, and with my team, we have organised um, this event today and tomorrow. Very happy to see you all here. Um, and I, especially those who have come from afar, um, we have friends from India, we have friends from Germany, from the United States, and many from around the UK. So thank you. Um, I'm not going to say any more other than some housekeeping, um, just a couple of housekeeping things. And then I'm going to hand over to Harry Charrington, Professor Harry Charrington, who is head of our department, who is going to um, open today's proceedings. Um, so just a couple of things. Guest Wi-Fi, in case any of you want to get onto the internet. Um, for EU university staff, you can use EduRoam. For those from elsewhere, go to, this is on your kind of internet network lists, Go to UOW Visitor, enter a sponsor's name, that's my name probably, just Lindsay. Um, complete the form and register, and then you'll have to inform me because I have to approve your request. It's a terribly circuitous route and probably won't work, but let's give it a, <laughs> give it a go. Um, so that's just for internet connectivity. Um, you will have noticed that our elevator is not working. Um, if any of you need to use an elevator, walk through the studio to the next stair core, and there's an elevator there that is working. And finally, toilets. Men are on this level, women are one level below, just behind this, the elevator core. Okay, so thank you. So with that, I'll hand over to Harry. Um, I'll stand here. Yes. I can do the mic. It's on? Good. So, good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to the Department of Architecture at the University of Westminster. I'm going to finish the housekeeping by doing the danger bit, um, which is in case of a fire, um, which actually is you either go out there and down the stairs or, more adventurous still, you can go round the back of the screen and there is a really lovely bit of 70s concrete exposed external fire escape that you can go down onto the street. I recommend that one. Should you be wanting... That's really important because after our launch, it was Yes, yeah, <laughs> we did. So we're hoping it won't happen. Um, and in fact, the fire alarm testing is always done on a Thursday morning, so we're past that stage. Anyway, back to the, back to the matter in hand. Um, it's really to uh, remind people a little bit of Lindsay's work and the whole work of monsoon assemblages, that it's a European Research Council research project which is housed within this department and it's been going for, for a number of years, it's got a number of years to go and it's form, formed around three critical uh, symposia, one of which is today, which is the second one, and um, the first one was a huge success, so we're really looking forward as a department to the outcomes of this, to what, what's, what's going to be said. I'd like to welcome, again, speakers from around the world, as has already been said, but to particularly note the keynote speakers that we've got here, Anurada Matarum and Dilip de Cunha from Philadelphia in the United States, very welcome, and Kirsten Hasterup from Copenhagen in Denmark as well, very welcome. We've also got speakers, and just to give you a sense of how much of the globe we're covering, from South Africa, from Johannesburg, from Tours in France, from Berlin in Germany, from New York, also in the United States, Chennai in India, and in the UK we're represented in alphabetical order by Bath, Brighton, Lincoln, and Southampton. And not only do they come from all over the world, we've also got an extraordinary mix of disciplines, um, which um, includes architecture, landscape architecture, planning, anthropology, environmental sciences, social sciences, and visual studies, and probably some others that I've forgotten, forgotten to mention, so apologies for that. But it is a truly interdisciplinary, truly cross-disciplinary interrogation of this territory, which I think adds something. And it not only adds something to us as a Department of Architecture about rethinking how we practice, but I've got a bit of an eye on the fact that in a few months' time, we are merging um, in 
uh, into a new school of what is called architecture and cities, and that is bringing in the existing uh, other department in the Faculty of Planning and Transport. And what strikes me as incredibly valuable about Lindsay's work, and I think a lot of the papers touch on this in, in one way or another, is the way that they bring in design as a factor into thinking about um, today, particularly about water, but, but thinking about the, and I'm going to use this word because I want to get in first with it, the Anthropocene, because I know you're going to get it somewhere else, and I'm just going to bag it first. But it, it does seem to me that thinking about design is extraordinarily important in that I think what we are living in, um, as much as a natural environment, is a designed environment. And unfortunately, it's designed often by um, accident. I don't think the intentions of the environment that we are living in um, is what we, we think of commonly as design, but they are, they are the consequence of a whole series of decisions that have, if you like, a side effects almost created this artificial, um, or artificial is perhaps a clumsy word, but, but certainly this very humanocentric, very um, problematic environment which we are trying to grapple with at the moment. And to counter that, I think we need to take design on as something strategic, something of intent, and to match the way we think about our practice of design at the scale of the other factors that are operating on the environment, and if you like, reshaping it and redesigning it in ways that are profoundly detrimental to the health of our planet. So with that, I'll be quiet, but just to reiterate, the welcome to you all, to thank you all for coming all of this way, and to making the next two days a real highlight of the academic year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Harshav Arden Bat, who is going to chair the first session. Um, and I think I'll... Harsh, you, you take the floor. Hi, um, E4, Pamela, and Jesse. Uh. So, we start today with the submerged, and there was something submerged about all of the three papers uh, with the first panel, and so in a way, so the submerged is what brought the three papers together, and, uh, but anyway, discussions later, uh, start out with E4 uh, Duncan from uh, Gold, uh, from the Goldman's, from the Center for Research Architecture, um, he's, who's a PhD candidate, um, and his research concerns memory and climate imaginaries, with a specific focus on cultural and aesthetic considerations of the spaces and materials of changing watery environments. So over to Ifor. So I've made a slight divergence from uh, my my abstract, but um, re retaining the kind of watery and kind of riverine or fluvial feel. Um, so in, Jan in January of this year, a mission comprised of lawyers and activists convened by the Rios Vivos movement, 
surveyed the Calca River Canyon, Colombia's second largest river and major tributary of the Magdalena River, taking the testimony of witnesses to the disappearance of over 600 people in the area, directly affected by the construction of the Hydro Ituangu Megadam. Rivers have been commonly used as a method in the countless disappearances that have occurred throughout the half century long conflict in Colombia. The Rios Vivos mission drew attention to the secondary obfuscation, or sorry, the secondary obfuscating effect of the $2.8 billion mega dam project on this traumatically charged section of the river. The ongoing multimedia project by Colombian artist Carolina Saicedo, one of the members of the mission, is entitled Be Damned and references indigenous forms of knowledge to challenge government and corporation policy of dam building in Latin America. For Saicedo, the construction of these dams, quote, signify the transition of public bodies of water into privatized resources, thus disconnecting the river from local communities. So it's end quote then. Submerging and displacing those above the dam while drying up and removing the riverine livelihoods from those living downriver. The Magdalena River is fundamental as a drinking water, a water, a drinking water and fish source for Colombia. Recent experiments on samples taken from stations along the entire length of the river identify the impacts of gold mining, oil refining, agricultural runoff, manufacturing industries, tanneries, and domestic discharges on river sediments. Particularly high concentrations of cadmium and lead were observed in samples obtained from mining and industrial, sorry, from industrial areas, including the town of Puerto Berrio, an important site for this paper. Cadmium and lead have adverse effects for both river ecosystems and resulting and those resulting from human consumption. Water resource scientist Peter Gleich has outlined the ways water has been historically used as both the objective, as both the objective and instrument of conflict. Here, I explore how the reappraisal of watery spaces, culturally and socially constructed as non or other spaces, encounters the rivers and their continued use of this and their continued use for disappearances and the erasure of the traces of violence. Some consider the funerary hydrography of these mass river graves to be a double death. Juan Manuel Echeverria's 2013 film, Requiem NN, focuses Sorry. Juan Manuel's 2013 film, Requiem NN, focuses on the funerary tradition of adopting anonymous bodies that wash up at the town of Puerto Berrio at a bend in Colombia's longest river, the Magdalena, which runs for nearly 1,000 miles from its source in the Andes in southern Colombia to its mouth, where it empties into the Caribbean Sea. Here I'm just going to play a brief extract from the film. Sus familiares 
es más que lo que están esperando. Mas, sin embargo, el río Magdalenas es su culpa. Eso aumenta más la cuerda después de una acogida al río. O sea, una doble muerte. Echeverria's film oscillates between the river's grave and the town cemetery where bodies that wash up are taken. The words of local fire captain Carlos Vega heard here echo the 18th century Neapolitan philosopher Gian Battista Vico's reading of the etymology or the etymological root of humanitas from the Latin for burial, humando. Vico's etymology is famously referenced by Robert Pogue Harrison in his book The Dominion of the Dead. This etymology, in part, claims that humanness is defined by the promise of burial and its associated rituals. Poe Harrison writes, humans bury not simply to achieve closure and effect a separation from the dead, but also and above all to humanize the ground on which they build their worlds and found their histories. To be human means, above all, to bury. Evident in this claim is the conflation of nature and culture that requires humans to be inhumed in the ground to reproduce a connection between the two. Set in this devout Catholic community, throughout Echeverria's film, the submerged, unin the submerged and uninhumed dead are referred to as being in purgatory. So the river is not just the route to the afterworld, as in many funerary mythologies, but it's a space of long and torturous interruption or suspension, and is, this, and is thus one last anonymizing insult. Hydrologically cent centered epistemologies have emerged in recent years, however, to compensate for long terrestrial biases. The names attributed to this emergence are often variations of the phrase, a watery sense of place. For the Sustainable Flood Memories Research Group, a watery sense of place means, quote, that living with water and water issues, for example, flooding, is part of, is part of individual and collective narratives of self and place, end quote. Thus, flood events in the west of England during the last decade or so reconnect local communities with the realities of their watery environments. Architect Cecilia Chen provides a somewhat less anthropocentric rendering of watery sense of place. For her, it is neither that waters contain places, nor that places contain waters, rather that thinking with waters in their dynamic, spatial, temporal, material, and semantic forms allows for what she calls a more thoughtful discussion of watery relations. This sensibility engenders place as always permeable and permeated with water, and likewise shaped by water quality, scarcity, and abundance. Thus Chen thinks bodies of water beyond the aquatic terrestrial threshold and instead through their entire catchment. The permeation of space with water is of course echoed by the work of our keynotes, Anirad Hamatur and Dilip de Kuna. They emphasize that the spatial element of hydrological thought depends on what they call the construction of reality in a moment of wetness. Indeed, in Arjun Apadurai and Carol Breckenridge's foreword to their book Soak, Mumbai and Estuary, um, Apadurai and Breckenridge state that wet theory accommodates flux, flow, and other boundary blurring phenomena at its core rather than at its reluctant boundaries. It means that the phenomenon of motion, migration, of disturbance, and of change must be, where appropriate, the building blocks of historical and geographical interpretations and not regarded as exceptional or outlier phenomena." End quote. Where the present is increasingly rethought around watery senses of place, so too the past and future to be approached through such moments on the spectrum of wetness. This in turn resonates with oceanic geographers Philip Steinberg and Kimberly Peters' proposal of a wet ontology to think aquatic space through its depth and in its three-dimensional and turbulent materiality, where, quote, the sea's material and phenomenological distinctiveness can facilitate the reimagining and re-enlivening of a world ever on the move, end quote. To understand a watery site as a hydrological and material catchment, 
also implies that it is a catchment of histories. In these material sites, multiple histories and presence are likewise enmeshing or moving into and out of confluence. In Puerto Berrio, as with other sites along the Magdalena River, a watery sense of place is in its own way entangled with the pollutants of heavy industry and mining, the spectral and real presences of the bodies left by conflict, and the local impacts on the lives of those living along the courses of the river by already constructed and planned major hydroelectric dam projects. How might these histories and materialities enter into confluence? If a river is a catchment, this does not necessarily mean that it catches these elements permanently, that these are always in spatial and temporal flux. The river brings different waters and their specific materialities, eroding rocks and silts, industrial and agricultural pollutants, into these bodies of water, which are, also, which are discarded with other unwanted anthropogenic elements, into and out of confluence with other waters and the specific materials they carry and deposit. Hydrofeminist theorist Astrida Niemannis formulates water's archival quality as relational with the human body and its own porous thresholds, a quality of both meaning and matter, where, quote, to drink a glass of water is to ingest the ghosts of bodies that haunt that water. When nature cools sometime later, we return to the system and the sea not, and, and the sea, not only our antidepressants, our chemical estrogens, or our more commonplace excretions, but also the meanings that permeate these materialities. Disposable culture, medicalized problem solving, ecological disconnect. Just as the deep oceans harbor particular records of former geological eras, water retains our more anthropomorphic secrets, even when we would rather forget. Our distant and more immediate pasts are returned to us in both trickles and floods. In the Columbian case, as elsewhere, rivers do not only bear the particular traces of violence, but are technologies of obfuscation. The red-brown of the Magdalena River eddying in the short extract from Requiem NN I showed you earlier, washes identities from the bodies, or from the dead, transporting, vanishing, and depositing them downstream. Through their flows and saltations, rivers narrate in their opacity and their rising and lowering multiple histories in unexpected, unpredictable, and sometimes traumatic confluences. What this narration tells us is that the very nature culture divides de Kuna and the Tur critique as manifest in the hard boundary or cartographic line produced by the colonial surveyor contributes to the sensory frontier water poses against perceiving, reading, and sensing the different forms of traces of violence present in subaquatic spaces. It is in this way that, waters are off, that rivers are often resistant archival spaces. Surface reflects back the sky above, rather than offering an insight into what is contained in the vertical liquid space beneath. This is a resistance that Steinberg and Peter's wet ontology challenges. Sensing toxicity in the three-dimensional and fluid materiality <coughs> of the very different political context of Montreal's Lachine Industrial Canal, environmental humanity scholar Peter Van Wyck considers the subaquatic space to be the material and sedimented accumulation of pasts. And he writes, from the bridge, the territorial archive is but a conjecture. The water below, as water, reflects the sky above, incidents, not the archive beneath, incidents. But this is only partially about the visible to begin with, the archive of toxicity is only ever legible and only then aided by multiple literacies and actors, from benthic organisms, macrophytes and mammals to biochemical transactions and curious academics. Another bridge then is required, a conceptual and hermeneutic bridge between the metropolitan archives and the territorial indices, inscriptions, traces, fluorescences and absences. In other words, the movement is not from archive to site, the indexical imaginary, but to see the site as archive, dispersed as it is. Perceiving, then, the fluvial processes of the Magdalena and Cauca rivers, amongst others, requires a similar multiplicity of approaches and actants, 
similar methods of perceiving fluvial processes as themselves dispersed archives of multiple forms of violence. This requires attempts to see through and with the opaqueness of heavy silts and reflective surfaces, and to move through the incidents to the incidents beneath, and to perceive the confluences of these pollutions and forms of violence in the river's archive. Rivers are thus shifting archives that can lend possible moments of unexpected clarity to the complex interconnectedness of struggles surrounding major infrastructure projects and dramatic changes to ecosystems caused by agriculture and extraction and with long histories of conflict where even the dammed river is the confluence of these traces. Thanks, Ifor. Um, we'll take questions in the end. Uh, I think it's it just be interesting to sort of have some content for our heads to process and then sort of get into a process of questioning. Um, next, we have Pamela Gupta, uh, who's going to talk about ways of seeing water. Pamela is Associate Professor at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of the Wits Waters Rand in jo Johannesburg, South, South Africa. She holds a PhD in social cultural anthropology from Columbia University, and she works, uh, her work explores um, Lusophone, post-colonial links, and legacies in India and Africa. Over to Pamela. I believe you have two images, so. Uh, no, I have a PowerPoint, okay. and then I have, to, I have to access the internet for three of them, but I put the hyperlink inside the Just this, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, since I'm short, I'm gonna. Uh, you can't really see me. I'm trying to think, what should I do? All right, well, I'm just gonna stay here because I have to coordinate. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Lindsay. Um, thank you to the project team. This is a wonderful experience to be here. Um, okay, so this is paper is very rough, work in progress. Um, I'll just start. Oh, okay. Yeah, I feel bad standing behind there because yeah, people can't see me. Just put it. No, no worries. All right. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. just skip it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For some reason it's not. Yeah. Here. It's fine. Take your options. Okay. I'll just stay here. That solves. Ah. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Let's start. Okay. Yeah. I'll just do this because I have to go to the. I might heat up with the hyperlinks. If. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, prelude. I've come to London to speak about water from the Cape in South Africa, where I have spent the last six weeks experiencing what it means to live in a city that is running out of water, where its taps could run dry. I'm one of the more fortunate ones, both because I'm staying in Stellenbosch, which is not as bad off as neighboring Cape Town, with a population of four million inhabitants, and because I'm only there for a short-term fellowship at Stellenbosch University, uh, my permanent residence being Johannesburg. There are daily reminders of a looming day zero, which is perpetually postponed. It was first set for April 2018, then August of the same year, and now it has pushed its clock to 2019, perhaps because Cape residents did take heed, for now anyways. 
Strict water measures include leaving swimming pools dry, not watering lawns or plants, taking five minute, now two minute showers, and availing of hand sanitizers in public bathrooms to replace running water. In Stellenbosch, you see a clever, and campaign, clever ad campaign in English and Afrikaans to appeal to its residents to take care of the world's most precious commodity, that is water. Perhaps the crisis has been averted, I'm not sure. I will be back in Johannesburg at the end of April, but then they say my city is not so far behind Cape Town. Okay, um, that was just a little bit of a prelude because I thought since we are talking about water and I am coming from the city of no water, um, I had to bring that into my presentation. Okay, um, I'm going to start with a quote by Mitav Ghosh from his book, The Great Derangement. For let us make no mistake, the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination. In his influential BBC series and landmark text on art criticism, Ways of Seeing, the late Jean Berger suggests that the way we see things is determined by what we know, and that this relationship is never settled. In this presentation, I take up his point to explore creative ways of seeing, and thus I mean reading, and re viewing, interpreting, and writing about the monsoons. The paper is a curatorial experiment, provides a way of thinking through monsoon matters, and specifically its wetness by way of its visual, sensorial, and effective attunements. This paper also extends a set of earlier arguments I made in an article I wrote entitled Monsoon Fever. In 2012, I wrote, quote, and here I quote myself, which is a rare thing, thus it is possible to conceptualize the monsoons as part of an Indian Ocean network that creates rhythms and patterns, that is, as having a role in creating a fundamental sense of oceanic being and place, but also as a space of future disjunctures of creating a sense of non-place in relation to a dramatically changing physical ocean. Precisely because of its defining character, connects water and sky and links geography, with politics and development, allows us to engage with the oceanic more seriously. In addition, the monsoon offers a point for reflection on connectivity, that is, on how people, things, and ideas travel in a changing Indian Ocean world. It is this latter point of the connectivity of people and things in a monsoonal world that I want to explore here six years later. Yet I want to move my discussion in another direction, focusing more narrowly on its visual, sensorial, and effective rhythms and patterns, experiences, and memories. Here I take up three representations or registers of monsoonal wetness. I first turn to a photographic series to get its visual and experimental co components as a lived environment following Marcus Taylor. I then turn to the production of rain perfume to access its often neglected other sensorial aspects, particularly that of smell and the importance of seasonality. Lastly, I look at the effective by way of a lone image that I came across whilst researching this paper that arrested my gaze to think about the already lost monsoonal. This paper is on another level an exercise in revisiting one's earlier work but from another perspective of time and space, when climate co-production, feel again a, a term used by Taylor, feels more palpable in the era of the Anthropocene, and here I am now the second person to use that word here, it is once again a way of seeing differently falling Berger. Perhaps my se experiment with seeing could be likened to what Stefan Hel Helmreich calls sounding, as investigating, fathoming, listening, to describe the form of inquiry appropriate for tracking meanings and practices of the biological, aquatic, and sonic in a term of global change and climate crisis. Okay, uh, okay we're going to have to go to that one. Um, how do I... Harsh, sorry. How do I get to that? What happened is this guy's series, for some reason, is is no longer on his website, so I had to find the Google literally in the last three days. So if you can get to that that link. I put it into the... I'll just start reading, if you don't mind doing that. Yeah. Okay. The visual. On 26 July 2005, the rain gods attacked Mumbai with relentless intensity. Nearly 30 inches of monsoon rain lashed the city within a 24-hour period. Water flooded many neighborhoods and clogged the city's drains, roadways, and suburban rail network. Yeah, that's fine. We can just leave it there. That's all we're going to get. Okay. Thank you. Transportation came to a standstill. Flights were canceled. The stock exchange closed. Schools and colleges shut down, and people waited or swam to safety. The flood evoked a primeval image. That idea of a city underwater is the stuff of myths. It was nature biting back, punishing humans. Its fury leveled their prized creation, the city. I opened my monsoon fever piece with this dystopic image from Guillaume Prakash's article entitled Mumbai, Mumbai, the Modern City in Ruins, which was written in 2008, in order to emphasize the monsoon as a grand spectacle of turbulence. 
It is now 10 years later since Prakash wrote his piece on this momentous event, and I want to put his passage on India to a different use, to suggest that we, we not forget it as we look at Ritesh Udham Chandani's more benign Facing the Monsoon photographic series, which consists of 49 images created on June 13th, 2014, in the Andheri suburb of Mumbai, near its metro stop. Um, and again, for some reason, literally in the last two days, his, his website link is no longer functioning, so I had to find him on Google. So you can see some of the images. Um, it doesn't give justice to the 49, actually, when you see them all together, but this is all I could do. Um, I'm not even sure half of these are not connected to, to series. So if you look at those first, uh, at least the first four for sure. Uh, definitely are. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. These are images of people persevering, umbrellas rendered useless by the rain and winds of wet feet, pants, shirts, sawar kameezes. In the series, there's a plot of man conquering nature, or maybe not. The monsoon becomes a character in itself. There's a showcasing of elaborate styles of umbrellas. I see polka dots, bow ties, flower prints, bright colors. Crowds of people create an umbrella of umbrellas as they wade through the muddy waters of urban Mumbai. I see hands holding hands, offers of support, especially amongst the women. I see a brisk business in rain gear, umbrellas, brain boots, and raincoats. I see smiles and grimaces in the face of adversity, a moment of intimacy between people and things as a woman walks with her phone, earplugs in, a faint smile on her face. Her umbrella, one of many, a mist of sea of umbrellas fighting the monsoonal elements. One man pulls up his already rolled up pants, another carries a massive plastic covered box supported on his head. I want to suggest that Udham Chandani's photo series shows perfectly the twin conditions of volatility and vulnerability that Lindsay Bremner has argued is presented by and through climate change, globalization, and rapid urbanization across the Indian subcontinent. These are visual and visceral images of the slow violence captured by Rob Nixon that we live with every day. They serve as a reminder that next year's monsoons could easily return us to that fateful day of July 26, 2005, which Amitav Ghosh has described as one of catastrophic suddenness, where the people of the city were confronted with the cost of three centuries of interference with the ecology of an estuarine location. 2.5 million people were underwater for hours together. Uh, and here's a quote. Images were first made to conjure up the appearances of something that was absent, writes Sean Berger. Perhaps the next generation of Mumbaiites will look at these images by Uttam Chandani and think if only we had taken care or wonder if the monsoons will ever return with such little or full, full force for it could go either way. So that they can too share in the experiences of their ancestors of walking through wetness on the streets of Mumbai. And I'm sorry those images didn't do justice to to the descriptions that I was trying to access. Okay, um, the next section, the sensorium. Oh, how do I get back to my PowerPoint? Uh, just minimize that. Yeah. And, okay, here we go. As journalist Cynthia Barnett reminds us, quote, every storm blows in on a scent or leaves one behind. In the second section, I turn to the sensorial aspects of the monsoon by looking at the fine art practice of creating, crafting attars, or capturing the fragrance of the monsoon in a bottle considered rain perfume. This event takes place in the village of Kanaj, home to 1.5 million people in UP in India. It's a seasonal livelihood that's supported by India's Fragrance and Flavor Development Center, a government agency that supports the local essential oil industry. In 2015, journalist Cynthia Barnett sets out to find out the secret recipe behind their production, by traveling to Kanoj to see the process firsthand. These attars are, quote, memory searing scents that capture the loamy smell of the first monsoon shower, or what I want to call here rain's redolence in a bottle. The process is a complicated one that involves extracting the earth's essence when the first monsoonal rains quench dehydrated ground. It is a scent that is so strong that supposedly, quote, can so tantalize drought stick, draft, drought stick and animals, sorry, that it sets thirsting cattle walking in circles. Extracted from parched clay and distilled with age-old techniques is known as mitiatar, earth's perfume. And here I offer a condensed version of the process. Basically, broken earthenware is put into a big copper vessel with water and heated up. Then the steam from the vessel is passed over sandalwood oil. The oil then captures the scent from the steam and the water is separated out. When you smell this perfume, the base note is sandalwood but the top note is the first rain after the summers. It is the smell of the monsoon. Barnett recalls the first time she smelled it. Quote, the mitiatar was in an inch tall glass bottle. I twisted off the gold cap, 
closed my eyes and breathed in the scent of the Indian rain. It smelled like the earth. It smelled like the parched clay doused with pond water. The aroma is entirely different from the memory of rain I carried from my childhood and my part of the world. But it was entirely appealing, warm, organic, mineral rich. It was the smell of waiting paid off. Forty years more for a sandalwood tree to grow its fragrant heartwood. Four months of hot, dust-blown summer in northern India before the monsoons arrive in July. A day for terracotta to slow fire in a kiln. It is, end quote, it is not only Indians who have attempted to capture the monsoon in a bottle. More recently, the French have turned to Indian attars for creating new smells and perfume markets. Un jardin après la mousson was created in 2008 under the Hermé lab label. According to its online advertising campaign, it, quote, explores the facets of an unexpected India when the monsoon restores to the earth what the sun has taken, chasing away the burning breath of drought. Ginger, cardamom, coriander, pepper, and vetiver, which I had to look up, which is a perennial bunch grass um, native to India, speak of the rebirth of nature captured in Kerala, a universe engorged with water. The nose behind this fragrance is Jean-Claude Elena. One fra fragrance review from March 14th of 2018 from Sudasian online reads, quote, most personal and intimate fragrance I've ever smelled. Beautiful and nostalgic blend of aquatic and citrusy notes on my skin. I would say it smells like rain in the Italian countryside during spring. Not a sunny smell. Actually, I would classify it as rather sad. There's nothing heavy or violent about it, but it's introspective and wishful, almost like a memory. Does the Hermé perfume portend a future moment when Mithyatars will no longer be seasonally produced by skilled craftsmen from an age-old recipe, but rather we will dab them onto our skins via a synthetically produced form available under a fancy designer label? Okay. Harsh, how am I doing on time? I have... Yeah, I'm okay? Okay. All right. In this third section of my presentation slash paper, I turn to a lone photograph taken by Indian photographer Arko Dato. It's very strange as I looked at, I found it a few months ago and then I've tried to find it again and I can't find it. So, elusive. Um, I chose to dwell inside of it to think about the effective and how certain images compel us to think or see differently. And in this case, it is the monsoonal wetness that this photograph accesses for me, almost as a past moment that I'm hopeful, nostalgic for. It is a sublime image, not only in its watery hues and folds and layers of cloth and skin in contact with water, but also its tangible quality that makes me want to touch it. At one level, it can be read as celebrating the sacredness of water. It is very much a romantic and romanticized version of rural India, suggesting that village Indians are more in tune and appreciative of the monsoons, as, a f and as well as a form of livelihood upon which they depend. Compared to the urban dwellers battling the monsoon showcased in Ritesh Uttamchandani's photo series that I showcased earlier. I see pinks, purples, faded greens, and blues that fade into a hazy background of never-ending water. I see seven people gazing in multiple directions with different kinds of looking taking place inside the frame of the photograph itself. I see a gendered India, the six women, one man all looking down or away from the camera. One woman averts her gaze, another has her back to us. The image suggests an intimate private moment of bathing within the monsoon waters, caught unaware by the photographer. In Camera Lucida, Roland Barthes develops the idea of punctum, the point to which the eye is drawn when looking at a photograph that goes beyond seeing by way of acculturation or familiar knowing. He writes, quote, the punctum then is a kind of subtle beyond, as if the image launched desire beyond what it permits us to see. It, denot end quote, it denotes the wounding, personally touching detail that establishes a direct relationship with the object or person photographed. Punctin, then, is what makes me single out this photograph by Dato, both for what it says and does not, its present abs absences. I see it alongside other images, both visible and remembered, for as we know, images are never singular. I want to offer up the point that punctum can potentially offer a way to read and make meaning of the monsoonal through the personal, the poetic, or as a form of affect. Here I return full circle to Jean Berger, whose ideas on photography prompted this curatorial experiment and ways of seeing water. Can we think more creatively then about the history of monsoon experiences and images that capture them in their pessimists as we portend a climate crisis and extreme weather kitchen conditions such as flash floods, hundred year storms, persistent droughts, spells of unprecedented heat, sudden landslides, raging torrents, pouring down from breached glacial lakes, and freakish tomato, uh, tornadoes. I almost said tomatoes, sorry. Um, which is a passage from Ghosh's uh, Great Derangement. Such that monsoonal wetness will eventually be betrayed and replaced with portraits of dryness. 
that is the event of the non-monsoonal. Instead, such as these other photographs that are taken by Dato. And then I found, which was interesting, is when I was trying to find this image. Um, Harsh, can you get to... Um, he did a series, the same photographer did a series. Uh, on, let's see if we can, and again, I couldn't, yeah, those are the images. Do, would you mind just scrolling through them for me? Sure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. So this is a, he did the accompanying images to a BBC um, photo essay on, on sort of dry, sp dry spots within the monsoonal. Um, I don't know if you can see the subtext, yeah, okay. All right, um, I'm going to conclude here. I hope that my presentation today has given a start to alternative ways of seeing, thinking, and understanding the monsoons and its watery past, presence, and futures. My presentation, on the one hand, can be seen as a form of politics, of staking a claim about climate change by way of the monsoon in relation to its properties of wetness. I'm asking what will happen to the connectivities between people and things that we see, for example, in an Uttam Chandani's photo series of urban dwellers paddling the monsoon, in the production of mitiatars or rain perfumes in Kanaj, India, or by Arkodato's sublime image of Indian villagers luxuriating in the monsoonal waters. Okay, and then can you go to that, back to my PowerPoint? And there's one last image. <laughs> Is it stuck? Uh, yep. Oh. Mm. Okay, that one. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Thanks, Rush. Okay. Um, where did I, I lost my place? Uh, okay. Oh, on the other hand, my paper, sorry, can be seen as a form of archival address and opening up of new ways of documenting the monsoon in the here and now by way of the categories of experience, the visual, sensorial, and the, uh, the affective. I want to end my paper with an image from South African photographers Gideon Mundell's Drowning World series, which was on show at the Witz Art Museum in Johannesburg earlier this year. With this exhibit, Mandel sought to document floods in 13 countries since 2007, including the UK, India, Haiti, Pakistan, Australia, Thailand, Nigeria, Germany, the Philippines, Brazil, Bangladesh, the US, and France, in order to quote, and this is from the catalog piece, explore the human dimension of climate change by focusing on floods across geographical and cultural boundaries to evoke our shared vulnerability to global warming, thus questioning our sense of stability in the world, end quote. The photograph I focus on here is an image of a water damaged family portrait taken from India, uh, sorry, from India taken in the year 2014. That's all I could find out about the image. I don't know much more about the photograph or the individuals in it, nor is it likely that I can learn more. It is an ordinary photograph on one level, yet its quality of patina and its bleeding of colors speaks volumes by capturing the frailty, fra frailty and fragility of the past and present in the face of an uncertain planetary future and the impending likelihood that the water will run out. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Um, next, we have Jesse Ransley, who's going to talk about living by, in, and on water, watery assemblages in the Carolan backwaters. Jesse Ransley is a senior research fellow at the University of Southampton. She studies South Asian seafar seafaring, maritime space, and the Indian Ocean, past and present. Her publications include papers on the embodied knowledges of boat building and seafaring, the South Asian uh, Laskers Maritime. Is it, am I pronouncing it right, Laskers? It's a European corruption. Ah, European yeah, European which is why I never heard it before. Um, maritime um, ethno-archaeology, heritage and archives, and the materiality, temporality, and politics of the oceans. Go to Jesse. Thank you. Um, right, so... Uh, yeah, I'm good. Do, you have a mic? Oh, do I need a mic? Can you hear me? Oh, if you stay here, it's fine. So I have to stand here? Oh, or if you want to walk, you can take the mic. Sorry. Can you guys hear me? Okay, then I'm fine. <laughs> Could you just give me, there's no clocks visible. Could you give me a five minutes so that I don't overrun? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, as Harsh said, I'm an anthropologist. I'm interested in how we understand maritime space. 
um, and particularly in how we conceptualise watery places. And I'm thinking particularly about the conceptions which run through disciplines from geography through to law and through to literature. There's very <clears throat> underlying assumptions about what watery space is. Um, in the context of that, I'm interested in the materiality, temporality, and the politics of oceans, um, and in when and how embodied knowledges of watery places became externalised and dematerialised. Um, but this afternoon, um, I want to tell you some stories, three stories, uh, one about fishing, one about mud collecting, and one about sand transportation. And they all come from the Ashtamudi estuary um, in Kerala in India. Um, and they all come from the village of Monodurta, which is in the estuary. So to begin with, fishing places. I thought I'd try and um, immerse you, sorry about the pun, very quickly in this area by reading you a description of fishing in the Ashtamudi estuary. <clears throat> the different fishing places in the channel between the islands of Patamdurta and Perandurta emerge through interactions between currents, fish and fishermen. In these waters, korovala, which are small seine fishing nets, are often laid in shallow waters where tidal eddies form, whilst the crab fishermen look for areas of calm, slack water. Patavala, lighter drift nets, are laid across running currents, and as these currents shift with tidal flows and monsoon rains, so do the fish, the nets, the fishing, and the places. This world emerges and is known through everyday practices and actions. As the seasons and weather change, it is a fisherman's depth of experiential knowledge of the estuary that enables him to keep catching fish. This knowledge is gained through doing, through moving from place to place over many seasons and feeling out when and where you should lay which net. It comes from attentively but intuitively feeling the wind on their bodies and the water and currents through the boat, through the paddle, through the net. As one fisherman is alert to adjusting the speed of the boat and the other to the rhythm of feeding the net over the side. They both apply their knowledge of the world and replenish it. As one boatman says, you learn by doing it. For as you learn the mechanics of hauling and casting nets, you also become sensitised to the wind and weather and their connections to the water and even to the lake bed beneath. Multiple forms of perception are combined in this process. A freshening wind is heard as well as felt and approaching rain is smelt as well as seen and through it you begin to know the world. It is even through the simple skills of moving about the boat, of balance, of your body learning to react to and anticipate the boat's response to your shifts in weight, as well as the currents, wind, and its own momentum, that the world around you emerges. This description of fishing the backwaters, I hope, um, illustrates something of the fluid relationships experienced by those who live and work on, in, and around any body of water. The watery world is temporal, multidimensional, and material. And those who live and work in it are attuned to it through their bodies, through everyday practices, and through the materiality of life. In modern Western thought, we understand seas, oceans, and other bodies of water as spaces to be exploited. You fish in them, you drill them, you mine them. They're also spaces to be trans transversed. They're conduits between lands. You survey them, you measure them. They are legal, abstract spaces, you know, the territorial waters, economic exclusion zones. Um, they're imagined through UNCLOS and other pieces of legislation and fought over in the South China Seas. And they are always, always metaphorically rich, fluid, unknowable, uncivilized, capricious, romantic, pure. And in this imagining, land and water are placed in opposition elements divided by coastlines. Swirling, ever-changing wild metaphors crash on the dry, civilised bones of land. Or unforgiving rivers carve out paths through the palimpsests of history. This leaves the transition between land and water, the cliffs or the gentle sands, as tantalisingly liminal. These are important thresholds. We see them as transformative space. Crucially, all of these imaginings cast watery space as passive. It's a backdrop to human action, or a metaphor for our ideas and our concerns. And as such, watery spaces are abstracted, they're external, they're ahistorical, and they're apolitical. 
Now, some of these imaginings are usefully provocative in different contexts, but I'm interested in the limitations of these models when they're faced with the texture of real lived experience. How thin these models are, when, when, um, how thin they feel even, when they encounter those fishermen, the water and seasons, and the everyday collective knowledges of living by, in, and on water. The coastal lakes and waters of Ashtonbury Estuary are clearly a resource. The estuary is fished in multiple ways. Mud and sand are extracted from the bed, coconuts grown on its fringes. Then close to the shores, there are trawlers and small-scale ice factories. Its waters are dotted with boats, with men and nets, and with ferries and tourist boats, and the, they're crisscrossing the estuary from the village to the town, and the tourists are always going on the authentic backwater cruises that go around Ashtonbury Estuary. So it's, you know, in those ways, it's a bucolic coastal scene. Um, but it's one that's also enmeshed in bureaucracy and politics. There are loan numbers carved onto the bows of those tiny fishing boats. Unlicensed sand transporting boats listen for the engines of police boats and hide in backwater channels. And the maps of estuaries pinned on, are pinned up in government offices in Kolam. The estuary can be read in all of those ways, but it is above all else a live space, not a backdrop against which human activity takes place. The lines of those government panchayat maps, like the Gulbama images which draw the shoreline through the frayed edges of land and water, do not reflect the way in which the village and lake are experienced out in the estuary. Rather, the places of the estuary, the fishing grounds and mud collecting places, sand mining spots, they emerge in the collective knowledges and activities of the estuary. Ashtamidi is produced through the shifting currents, the rhythms of the monsoon and its tides, the movement of the fish and the skills of those fishermen who work with the boats and nets, with the wind and rain, as well as with each other. It emerges through the mud and the sand, the boats and the bodies, even through the fish, as well as those policemen as well. So my work, and increasingly that of other um, anthropologists, archaeologists and geographers, Ivor mentioned Kim Peters um, and Phil, um, um, there's this group of people who are increasingly interested um, in, ima in imaginings of watery space which are historical, which are political, which are active, which are visceral, um, and which are above all material. That's my first story. <clears throat> my second story, mud and water. So, um, in Monotruta, the village that I'm going to talk about is in Ashtamudi, the boundaries between land and water are blurred. This is not an image of a flood. This is an image of a blurring. The watery betweenness of Monotruta is part of the everyday, deeply embedded in the regular rhythms and pragmatic living of village life. The physical boundary between land and water is mutable and constantly renegotiated. People regularly and unaffectively remake land and water. The paddy field becomes a coconut grove as mud is collected from the paddy's bed and raised up around new palms. And simultaneously, you make land and a new channel. The coconut grove becomes a prawn pond as the revetment is built up and the channel is widened. The intricate network of channels and canals that weave through the village are subject to change, to widening, to infill, to reopening. And the older generation of, of people in the village made the land their houses are built on. They collected mud from the lake and the infilled paddies. Mud collecting is still just about a profitable livelihood in Monotorita. Um, so I worked with a guy called Babu. This is actually his um, companion, Devadas. And what he's doing is um, literally collecting mud from the bottom of the lake. So he is, he's staked his um, ketuvalam and he's diving down, he's using his feet and sometimes his hands to cut chunks of mud and then he's coming up through the surface and putting it in the boat. And you get paid by the boatload, half boat, full boat. Um, once they, they cut the mud from the shallow areas of the lake bed, oh hang on, they, um, they, take, they take it back into the village. This is Babu and this, you can see how heavily laden the boat is now, it's suddenly sitting so low in the water. It's a different set of, of bodily knowledges are required to move your boat back in, not turn it up, not drown yourself. And when they get back to the village, it's used to build coconut groves and fields and revetment. So the mud you see around these, these um, coconuts on the edge of one part of the village is recently um, from the lake bed. In this way, parts of the village are made from the lake and the two categories are constantly blurred. 
Similarly, water itself keeps shifting in an active environment. That, um, it, it constantly re-establishes balance. So in places, it's hard to determine where the lake edges and where the land ends or begins. Prawn ponds and channels blend into the lake, and small tidal or seasonal rises in water level submerge revetments in areas of reclaimed land. Physically, land dissolves into water, and water is absorbed into land. The monsoon amplifies all of this. Monsoon water falls down. It soaks in. It rises up and seeps through. The channel and the waterways run with new water from the hills above, and fresh water begins to dominate this side of the estuary again. Channels grow and backyards shrink. Mud and water are not discrete materials. They are constantly intermingling. And this mix is, mix in, mixing is not a catastrophic sorry, flood. It's not a simple sudden submergence. It's not a crossing of a line. Instead, it's a sometimes problematic, but very regular rhythm of the place. This boundary between land and water is also permeable and indistinct in people's experience of and movement through the world. People move in and out of water habitually as they move around the village. They weigh channels, get in and out of boats, daily chores, washing clothes, for example, as well as work like mud collecting and sand miving. Move them in, under, and through water. Fishermen sit in their boats at lakeside tea shops to eat, and people climb in and out of uh, the Karata, which is a small ferry. Discussions are held from boat to land. People call out across rivers and gather news from boats as they pass. Monroe does not end at the water's edge, even if you could define where that very edge is, but incorporates land and water, blended and intermingled. So that was my mud and water. And this is um, my story about Lali, which is about the problem of edges. So I've said that there are no real edges in Monroe that the lake and village are, are not divided by a shoreline. Um, and the reason I haven't shown you a map of where it is in the world is because maps are very problematic in this context. So this is um, the uh, Arabian Sea. Sorry, every time I move that way. So you've got the Arabian Sea on one side, and you've got Karel on the other, and uh, Ashtabudi Estuary is here. So if you are looking at maps at this scale, you've got a hard line. You've no sense that it's water. It's a watery place. It looks like you're in land. You get a bit closer, suddenly you have a lake with very clear, defined edges. This is Ashtamudi Estuary. Um, the translation of Monroe Island is Monroe the area, the village that I was working in. And this is Monroe Torota. You know, this is, a, this is not land, this is not water, this is somewhere in between. It's, um, it's like the, the idea of, um, I think the frayed is the nicest description because of all of the paddy fields you're seeing in the image. And the question keeps coming up, where is the edge of the village? You know, where, where does the village end? Where does the lake begin? So I'm going to attempt to answer that for you now. In Monoturuta, most water occupations and activities, like mud collecting, sand mining, and transporting coconuts or livestock around, happen within a very short distance of people's homes. However, there are people, fishermen and sand, tran tran sand transporters, like Lali, that, who travel kilometers into and across the wider estuarine lake when they work. And they employ a different set of knowledges and skills to those boatmen who are using the poles you know, inland. Lally um, is one of the sand transporters. He's working in an illegal industry. So his is his boat stashed out of the way. You don't want to attract anyone's attention. <coughs> um, this is what sand mining is. So uh, Kerala's had, a, well, had before the crash of a massive rise in building. What you need to build is aggregates. Um, and the aggregates are illegally mined from lots of watery places. So they're getting sands and gravels off the, the bed of the lake. Um, they're using the special baskets for that work. They're diving down again. This is very dangerous work. Uh, even more so than the mud collecting, it's also illegal, so you've got to keep your eye out for the police. Um, they, you see groups of boats in the middle of the estuary moving the sand backwards and forwards between them, and then you can transport it to the actual building sites, because on the southern lake, you have all the posh houses that are going up, and that's where you take your aggregate straight to the edge of these flash houses. Um, so the sand transportation involves taking these very heavy loads across the lake. The lake is very large, you're sailing, and you're dealing with very different sets of skills. Okay. So there you go. This is what it looks like when you've got a loaded boat. It, um, it looks quite beautiful because there's no... Um, there's no wind at that point, but once you get out into the middle of the lake, it can be very dangerous. 
So the boundary between village and lake is not then the ephemeral shoreline, but the boundary between the area that um, someone like Lali works in, knows and, ex and experiences, and the area within which their friends and neighbours move. Different skills and equipment are required to paddle, pole and sail longer distances, skills which can only be acquired and tested through experience of storms and sudden changes in wind or tide. Similarly, knowledge of different places of the lake bed, currents and confluences of tidal flow and wind patterns are not needed nor required in the village. According to Lali, this experiential division is about half a kilometre from the shoreline. As he describes it, the boundary of Monroe Turata emerges through being in the world, through embodied skills and knowledges involved in those everyday activities. Yet, importantly, this boundary does not bind Monroe Turata. The edge of the village reflects patterns of activities that move and change and occur in time. As the description of fishing at the beginning of the paper suggests, places move as the seasons and weather, the tidal flows and currents change. It is far easier, therefore, to identify when you are in the lake or in the village, in the midst of multiple confluences of boats and nets and fish and sand and body and water and mud. Um, it's much easier to identify being in than it is to identify the border between. The village edge is an elastic, experiential boundary, one that is unidentifiable, blurred, close up, and blurred close up, but emerges through the flows of material skills and knowledges in a dynamic environment. Thus, the distinction between village and lake does not make Monroturata a bounded place, but instead, if I can use Ingold's phrase, it does not turn the pathways along life, along which life is lived, into boundaries within which life is contained. Instead, it unfolds and is revealed across time and space as people move through and inhabit the world. Rather than existing as an external entity, it occurs in the comings and goings of humans and other organisms, in the jumbles of interactions between persons, things, and the weather world. Life is not lived bounded, but rather it is in the open, and it is where this bundle of life paths, of activities and actions, meshes that Munro Turuta emerges. So what I'm suggesting is that the embodied knowledge of watery space, of currents and tides and weather, um, of that being in the world, the mixing and merging and mingling, are all omitted, they're all absent from those discussions of economic exploitation or the abstracted legal geographies that, frame, that are framed through lenses of, of modernity, modern thought about maritime space. Okay. <clears throat> When I talk about this conceptual separation, though, there's one really important caveat. When I talk about the conceptual separation of land and water as a product of Western modernity, I am not presenting this example as somehow pre-modern. That's a very false correlate. And um, I'm an anthropologist, so you don't want to get me started on the way in which we represent Indian villages as timeless and pure, and as, which is basically another word for primitive, um, and as that kind of repository of this pure past knowledge, which is infuriating. So I'm really desperate for you to be aware that I'm not doing that here. Um, you've probably detected some phenomenological approaches in my framing of these three stories. I've quoted Ingold, I've certainly drawn on perceptions of environment and his weather world ideas and there's obviously some Heideggerian readings of being in the world in there as well. But my three stories still feel a little bit as if they're leaning towards that unfettered timeless idyll in this current reading. And in order to move beyond that, to entangle these stories in the political and historical more explicitly, I want to conclude by turning to a new material framing of watery places. At the foundation of new material or process philosophy is the call for a flat ontology, one in which humans, um, neither humans nor materials, are a priori. So, they are understood as having equal, as being equally constituting and constitutive of the world. Both Ingold's meshworks and assemblage theory as expressed by Delander begin with the flat ontology. Both take Deleuze's work as their inspiration to explore the way that people, things and the world are related to one another, the way that things, relations be between things and collective entities are always in emergence. An assemblage theory demonstrates how people and things are resonant with capacities to act and affect and that they are bound into continually emerging multiple assemblages as they circulate through the world. I know that's a huge, massive concept, so I'm going to give you um, a quote from Delander. So, um, moreover, 
the consequence of that really important flat tautology. In Delander's words, are, it, it allows for the possibility of complex interactions between component parts. And allowing for that is crucial to define the mechanisms of emergence. But this possibility disappears if the parts are fused together into a seamless web. That made a lot more sense than I'm reading it and writing. I hope it makes sense when you're reading it from the screen. I'm going to give you an illustration. So Delanda ab is advocating, um, advocates that we regard the components of an assemblage not as fixed entities, but as able to move between assemblages, produce different properties or qualities as they do, and thus being interconnecting and affecting of other assemblages at different ranges and scales. So what he's saying is that it's, nothing of this is bounded. Assemblages move within assemblages, it's moving out, it's expanding over time. And turning to this body of theory um, provides a unique and reductive way to think about materialising mar um, maritime space and watery places. It moves against those ideas of these things as external. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to return to those fishermen to give you my illustration to explain why I think this is important. I'm going to return actually quite specifically to fish. Everything I've talked about so far has placed the uh, people and their activities at the centre. It's, it's seen the world emerge through everyday activities and movement. Okay, and I want to talk about fish to end. So most fundamentally, addressing Ashtamudi estuary not only as a live space, but as an assemblage of human and non-human things, of materials connected across time and space, allows us, in fact it requires us, to reconceptualize watery space in a non-anthropocentric way. It requires us to think of it historically and politically. It it requires us to anchor it materially in time and space. It's not that timeless idyll, it's not an onward imagining, it's very, very real, it's very material, it's very present. Those fish that the, these guys are trying to catch, they move and gather and spawn and grow with the currents and the rhythms of monsoon, of night and day, and in response to storms and the shifting physical geography of the estuary and the sea. The boats, the nets, the sp and the specific skills and bodily knowledges of the fishermen, the visceral activities of fishing, the muscles involved in balancing on the boat, hauling the nets, the nets rubbing on the boat's shear lines, the fish scales left on the frames, the sand and mud in the boat's seams, the mollusks boring into the boat's timbers, they all quietly affecting change. The boat, re the boat repairs that take place in the monsoon season, the fish and cashew oils painted onto the boats, and the fish curry eaten at home are all entangled in this assemblage. They all are equal, they're all in that flat ontology. And they are the material flows which produce the estuary. <clears throat> but these patterns are not timeless, they're not pure, they're not unfettered or a dill. They have history and they have a durée. Fishing places move with rhythms. They're returned to, they're held in human memory. But these places also have a material reach back in time and across sea and inland. They reach back through the nitrates and the minerals brought down from the hills with the monsoon rains. And they stretch inland and out to sea, to the villagers selling their mango tree for boat timbers and to the fishing trawlers pushed increasingly further offshore by larger scale of, of um, external drivers. Sorry. And in this way, they also reach out and extend into the debt and the aid, both local, federal and international, to the licenses and the loans, the politics of illegal sand mining and the microeconomics of fisherwomen collectives. These waters are political as well as historical and visceral and tangled. So what I've sought to demonstrate today then is how productive assemblages are in theorising and materialising watery places. Beginning with a flat ontology is a political and radical act. It moves us beyond the idea of lived space alone and allows us to reconceptualise watery space in a non-anthropocentric way. It allows us to move from the reductive and stilted perspectives which pit land in opposition to water um, and in which wa the water is conceived as a surface, a resource, a territory or a metaphor, that very passive medium. Instead, it enables us to examine how watery space is always material, visceral, political, temporal and affective. And as a result, how the people, things and places that engage in those spaces are always in emergence. Thank you. Um, I, sorry, I just wanted to say, uh, I worked the whole time with Maranuka Henry, who is still in Kerala, and this is the other person that produced this research. Thank you very much. Is that right, then? Um, 
Uh, <laughs> oh no, that's what's your favorite picture? Uh, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, yeah, um, I was. I mean, if if I can just take the just starting up, I was. Um, uh, <coughs> I was I was really intrigued by the um, by the by the mud. Uh, dredging practices, and I was, because I've seen it when I was really, really young, and this was in um, a part of Karnataka, uh, but it's, it's, it's not practiced anymore, so I was, I was really, I was, I was really, um, but, it, and, and there's also this process of modernization, and this process of um, uh, precarity, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the increasing pre you know, precarity of a certain kind of uh, um, uh, economy when it comes to, 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 to do with these practices. So I was wondering if you could just I mean, comment on that in terms of um, how these practices are, are, they, are they sustained by the state? I mean, because I mean, because sand mining has its own economy and I was wondering if the economies of sand mining and the economies of this practice are connected. No, um, okay. but um, the sand mining is, uh, it's, it's gone through a really interesting pattern. I mean, there was a, a massive boom in sand mining. There are licensed sand miners. There's a very small selection on the Calada River. Um, but most of it's illegal, and there was a big boom. Um, uh, I don't know how much people know about Kerala. So Kerala there's a, there was, has, this, has been in the last 20 years a strong connection with Gulf states. There's a lot of money that's come back into Kerala from the Gulf states. But with building and development, it's a very um, vibrant place. It's really um, moving in lots of directions all at once. Um, and so that demands resources when you're building at speed. So um, the, the sand mining comes from that quite external. It's very external to the village as well. The mud collection is, is, is within the watery part of the village, and that's very much about making land and, and coconut groves in the village. Um, but, I, but I don't think anyone sees it as a traditional practice that is sustained in any way. It's, it's one of many different jobs that someone like Devadas or uh, Baba would do. And it's very much connected to the rhythms of, of larger economics and, and of modernity. It's not some kind of pure thing that's happening there. I mean, Babu's son is studying to be an aeronautical engineer. It's not like he's living in a past world. Um, and a lot of the ways in which the Mono as a village has uh, had something of a boom with the boat building related to sand mining, the requirement for boats. And that's in recent years, in the last few years, since I did this research and post the crash and all of those other global repercussions have obviously been felt in the village and there's less boat building. There's more mud collecting as a result of that <laughs> because you switch between things. I don't know if that answers the question. So we have a healthy time for Q&A. Um, uh, yeah, op open for questions and discussion. modern and pre-modern um, and I come from a visual arts background so it, it deeply fascinates me but I'm also was interested in Pamela's last slide because all through your work I, your presentation I was thinking of the work of Gideon Mendel and I wonder whether you would place his characterizations his images where you would place them within a post-modern pre-modern non-modern post-human whatever where would you put them <laughs> <laughs> Both of you, all of you. <laughs> so, well, that's a hard one. Um, so the exhibit had a lot of the, the I, I don't know his work that well, so it was an exhibit I sort of stumbled into that was on show at my university, the art, ex um, the gallery space there. Um, I find a lot of his images problematic, and I'm not exactly sure why, but I do, and there is, um, so I don't have a sustained reason behind them. That's why I was cautious. I didn't want to focus really on his work, but I, the idea of these images in the water on the photographs as another layer of thinking about photographs did the kind of work I wanted it to do. Um, so I used it in a particular way as opposed to trying to make an argument about his work, um, and that would require more sustained research in his work to be able to answer that fully. Um, but from my own visual perspective, a lot of his images are quite romanticized versions of things. So, yeah. Thank you for that question. OK, 
Okay. Oh yeah. I'm really. Uh, there was the idea of um, water as archival mm. came up in both your papers, mm. and um, the other thing I'm as is an archaeologist, a marathon archaeologist. So archives and archival, and there's a strong sense. Yeah. And there's a strong sense in which counter-modern approaches to landscape and six area. <laughs> yeah. So I was interested in. Is that yeah? Yeah. yeah. So I was interested in the way archival, water as archival, came up in both the other mm -hmm. papers. Um, and a, a lot of the counter-modern um, approaches to landscape and, and more recently maritime space are, are pushing back against this idea of that palimpsest of history and that, that mm -hmm. kind of collective, mm -hmm. passive record. Um, and I was really interested in if, how you felt that archival idea and image, whether it was material or whether it's a metaphorical idea. And, and if you found that useful or, or was it jarring? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's actually to start to speak to the Mandel picture, actually. I think um, the, the effect of water kind of speaks to this kind of how, how, how often water is seen as being an archival, as a materiality, because, you know, with that photograph, it yeah. produces this kind of, um, um, it blurs and, it, and, and, it, and the wetness is actually kind of de-archiving in a way, or like the, the quality, supposed quality, in, but in reality it's actually informing that material. Mm -hmm. that, so it's effective that, that rather than... Present. Yeah, but then also that to then flip it, to then not think about the effect of water on the terrestrial archive, but then to think, I think, which is what your question mm -hmm. is, more directed to, is like the actual aquatic archive. So I, don't, I don't just see it as being metaphorical, which is often yeah. mm -hmm. how it's produced, but actually as being, you know, it's, it's how it's sensed and it's how it's perceived as potentials for these materials in wh whether they can actually be located or salvaged in any mm -hmm. kind of way but are still existent within watery space that's really interesting thank you um yeah that's a great question actually um well what started this paper was i wanted to sort of look at archives of the visual around the monsoon and mm -hmm. i was struck by so in some sense i was looking at a material archive yeah. oh sorry i was trying to find a material so archive um yeah of the visual on the monsoons and it was surprising how little there actually was um and uh, what is the name of that uh curran right has mm -hmm. a you know there's again to go back to laura's point about the sort of romanticized version of photographs on the mm -hmm. monsoon i didn't want to use those you know so there was a way in which i wanted to think through the archive through an effective way of thinking mm. through that archive. And that helped me organize my own archive. And also this idea of the archive of the future and its watery futures as being... So sort of stretching back yeah. and forwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. During the presentation, I think the presentation is very interesting. I don't know whose presentation it was, but somehow the idea that the the monsoon is a lived thing. I mean, it came out of all the presentations. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously there's no monsoon in this room. Well, maybe not obviously, maybe not so. But the, my question is, um, so this idea of the monsoon is a lived thing, which I think all your presentations demonstrated. But then what is the status of the monsoon when we think about something like, like an archive, which as you're talking about now, or, um, or a conference like this one? What, what's the the phenomenon of monsoon in a conference or an archival or a university setting? Do you want me to? Well, the monsoon's both a material uh, assemblage and an idea. Um, so we're talking about it as, as both contexts in, in this symposium. People are discussing it as conceptual, but they're also discussing it as very material. Is that fair enough? Well, of an the, the lived aspect, I suppose. So the, so the monsoon is a lived thing, which you, you demonstrated, and then what, what is, the, is, the mon is the monsoon a living thing when it moves well, into the archive or I into the conference or into the university? Mm. I, don't, I didn't mean to present the monsoon as a lived thing, because that kind of implies that it's an entity, a bounded thing, but that there are elements of, of, of material flows and, uh, that move in time that are part of an assemblage, and that assemblage is... Um, has assemblages within and beyond, and that lived experience humans are part of that assemblage too. In that sense, it's lived, but but definitely not as that sort of atomized monsoon person moving in and against each other. I mean, I re that's really not what I was trying to do. So. 
Um, just to add to it, I think I used the word lived environment from Taylor. I can't remember the title of his book, which you guys had used as well. Um, just to think about, the, again, I think this goes back, parallels your point, is the sort of the assemblage of that em environment. So what is it like to live with the monsoons every year versus people who don't even know what the monsoons are or have ever experienced them, right? So the ways in which it's not seasonal, it's, uh, it's experiential, it creates memories, you know, I'm Indian diasporic to go back to India, we would always go during the monsoons. So for me, India and the monsoons are part of my lived environment, um, if, if that's one way to elaborate on that. Um, I think, yeah, it, it's pushing in an interesting direction and what is it to bring it here? I guess I want to capture some of that sense of it or sensorial aspects of it by trying to present on it as an environment, as something living. Yeah. Did you bring the perfume? No, I didn't bring it. I haven't bought the perfume. It was quite expensive, actually. <laughs> and, and, and also, um, and this is, it's interesting because I was, we were just having this conversation earlier. I mean, the, the, the monsoon is a life force that sustains a majority of humans on this planet. And in a way, as a knowledge system, has really not um, uh, been, you know, healthily interrogated, uh, so to speak. And so in a way, the monsoon, I mean, from the assemblage of the fish curry to um, the, the fact of uh, bodies in this room uh, depend on the monsoons to even sort of exist in this moment in time and space. And uh, from, a geopo from a geopolitical, from a economic, uh, from a, I mean, I don't know, from an, multiple different perspectives. The university would not exist without the monsoons, but that would be my proposition. Well, if, you want to go back, um, <laughs> if you want to go back historically, monsoon winds were part of what built Britain. Big, sorry, sorry, if you want to go historical and you put it in a post-colonial yeah. context, monsoon winds are part of what built Britain. You know, this is the East India Company, this is empire, this is what produced that. And this is probably what produced most of the buildings surrounding us as well. I mean, if you, if you extend backwards in time, you can say the monsoon contributed to pretty much anything. If you want the renaissance of industrial, I mean, the, the fabric of this, of this country is built on <laughs> the, the wealth of the monsoons. <laughs> so, but, Philip. <laughs> 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 Not everybody might agree with that one, yet, you know. uh, but uh, you know, I want to thank you all. I mean, that was a you know wonderful set of presentations, and um, I, mean, I think uh, uh, finding a sort of commonality can be easy, uh, but I think it is also somewhat difficult. But I'm going to I'm going to uh, just sort of try one thing because I, I couldn't help noticing. I would say you'll all anchor actually the monsoon in water or some form of it, a wateriness yeah. and. Uh, and that seems to be, you know, the obvious thing to do, uh, you know, because it is rain and, you know, yeah. and, and so on. But, uh, but that carries a sense of otherness, which was sort of in, inescapable, actually, in all your presentations. And uh, I think, Jesse, you, you sort of made it a point to sort of apologize to some extent. For, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, offered an apology as well for it. Uh, but, uh, but that otherness, actually, I mean, I want to know, what is it otherness to? You know, so in your case, I mean, it seemed most obvious in the sense of it being, you know, that there was this land, uh, land water divide mm -hmm. and, you know, and uh, water, I mean, if I had to look at practices, there is a sense of blurred, there's a blurredness that, mm -hmm. I was looking at the images actually that you all showed and there was this blurredness, mm -hmm. uh, the sense of blurriness. I mean, it, mm -hmm. to me, it, you know, as a designer, it suggests that I'm anchoring in something, you know, I'm anchoring in a line, I'm anchoring in uh, thing. And so the necessity of that becomes, questionable, mm. but, uh, but are you troubled at all mm. by this otherness, actually, that, that you are, you know, sort of trying so hard to explain? Um, I think in the context of, um, I think in the context of uh, monotorita, it's, it's, it's not other, it's very everyday, um, and, it's, and it's only um, in my, you know, I'm a, white woman from uh, Southampton taking nice pictures of, of people in lungis and putting them on a wall that does things and that others it. Um, it isn't in the context of Monwaturuta, it's very everyday. And it's, uh, I did, it shouldn't be just waters. We're in a monsoon water symposium, but obviously it's also the, it's also, um, the wind and it's the currents and it's the smells and it's also the, the, that rhythm, the space and time is very real. But, f but within the village, for, for most people, it's, 
it's not that interesting. <laughs> Um, it's not that interesting. It's it's memory in positive ways. It's problematic and difficult sometimes, but it, it's not dramatic and it's not a flood and a submergence. It's a slow coming and a moving through, and it's a marking of time, I suppose. I'm concerned with this mm. not, 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 not. Mm -hmm. Actually, okay, not this I write that way a lot. Right. <laughs> you know? And when I'm pushing back against something, I often mm. write that way. So I'll try and remedy it for the paper. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's. Um, for me, I'm, I'm kind of yeah. I'm probably just highlighting its otherness. But in in reality, in what I'm trying to, my intention is to kind of consider that that always othered space as actually containing so many elements of things that, generally, in the terrestrial terrain or the constructed terrestrial ter terrain, are considered to, to be no that that are entered into that watery space so that the it's not just that the water is say on a spectrum between different forms of dryness and wetness or wetnesses as you might say put it but that also that the watery space also contains lots of the drynesses and and archives perhaps or transports them into different um, relationships so yeah um, I'm, I'm going to attempt to answer that question by saying um, I'm dealing with layers of otherings. So I'm othering other people's otherings. <laughs> this, this is the idea of ways of seeing on some level, right? My conceptual frame through John Berger is to think about that, that a way of seeing is always subjective, always a, a, a form of othering, right? And by, my, by way of, of different forms of othering, so. Can I come back to the not thing? I just uh, sorry, it just occurred to me that um, listening to Ivor that um, it's probably also a reflection of the fact that that um, water has not been theorized and conceptualized as much. There is so much about the ways that we conceive and imagine of land, um, but we don't do the same. So there's a, a, a lot of things to say it's not in order to frame what it is, mm -hmm. and I will try harder in future just to say what it is. <laughs> Thanks so much for three great papers to open our symposium, really fantastic. Um, I want to address a question to Iva. Um, great to have the Center for Research Architecture represented here, thank you. Um, I was really interested in your introduction of the word catchment um, to your understanding of the river, which I think is extraordinary, you know, because one could talk about a watershed, mm -hmm. which implies, you know, the watershedding or the yeah. catchment, and you used the word catchment, as I understood it, to get away from the river as a line. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to just hear you talk a little bit more about, about the use of the word catchment. I, yeah, I mean, I'm using the word catchment there to, to kind of understand how, as to break away from the line, that, the wa that water is existing in the spectrum from the top of a mountain or in the air, to, but how it's more densely caught within that space and then cut to that space as well. So there's a kind of interconnection between these, these, these different situations where water is, com is constantly coming into the catchment of the, of the river and out of it through, most obviously through tributaries and distributaries and other forms of rivers or into lakes, but also through evaporation or through um, non-point entry through riverbanks, etc. cetera, um, run field runoff. Um, so I'm thinking about it as, as a catchment of of, of an already existing liquidity or wetness in the environment. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, thanks. Thanks, all of you, for really interesting papers. Um, Jesse, I guess my question is for you. Um, I wanted to try and understand when you said that well, water begins and when the village ends and there's a kind of blurriness in between that. I wanted to kind of understand that in, in slightly more complex fashion where who does it end for at a certain point? Um, who does it begin for when? So is there a kind of stratification within the village itself that defines where water can begin and where um, land ends or, or vice versa? Uh, especially the coal, I'm assuming these are all coal cultivation, um, paddy fields. Some, some of them are, oh, some increasingly of them are. now, yeah. Okay, okay, so I mean in, in that context is there, um, can, I mean can we think of the category of the human in, in a slightly 
different fashion? I, I think um, it's, it's, it's a shift in categories because it's about village versus lake rather than land versus water. So the village incorporates water um, and it incorporates what we would see as part of the lake. Um, and I think there is, I don't know about stratification, but there is definitely a sense in which different groups um, move and do things within the village. So, the, so uh, the fishermen and the sand transporters are the general occupations that go beyond and that would say, be able to say to you when they're in the lake so they could point to the boundary. But from within the village, you're not really interested in um, the edges of it. You don't, you're gonna to point to it. You know this water is part of it and part of your, um, your space. Um, so there are certain groups, and in, in this particular area, the, the fishermen are Christian groups. They're from a different, um, traditionally from a different caste group, and the, the sand transporters are, are quite a new um, group of people. It's entrepreneurial. There's a slightly different setup as well. So yeah, there is a stratification, but I think quite a lot of people in the village wouldn't even consider it. I asked a lot of weird questions as, as far as a lot of people were concerned. Does that help? Thank you. Oh, yeah. All the people you referred to were were men. I just yeah. wonder how the village begins and ends for women and for children and um, for other groups. The I think for for most um, women it's it's village rather than lake. There's only a couple of occupations that involve going beyond. But at the same time, I mean, a lot of women work and they work in the city. They work in other areas and they're travelling across the lake. Um, there are different ways to do that. Um, it's most efficient to, to go on the, the ferry, the ferries across the lake, smaller and larger ferries. I've got lots of pictures of women in boats, which I didn't use today, maybe I should have evened it out. But I think in general, yeah, the, a lot of the occupations and activities that are specifically watery in the lake are male, definitely. Um, which was, you know, interesting. I was an interesting anomaly in that context. Um, but a lot of the watery occupations in the village are female. So it depends where you are and how you are. It's, I think it's a similar reflection of what you'd find in other forms of, of village life if they, if they were terrestrial and not um, watery. Although I don't like making that divide and I just have in my sense. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Thank you. Uh, well, oh, 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 yeah. just before you stop. Um, I, I, I uh, was wondering whether, um, Jesse, in regards to your uh, questioning about so the edge between the land and the water, mm -hmm. um, whether methodologically you considered um, exploring representations of that through sort of local mappings and that type of work, mm -hmm. whether there was any evidence um, that you found of how local people perceived and recorded their environment. I'm a I tried to, I did explore that with different groups of people at different times. So I worked a lot with boat builders separate to this work as I've done a lot of work with um, the guys that, the, that built the log boats and the guys that built this, the, what we call sewn boats, but actually tied boats. Um, so there's a lot of time on building sites where I asked questions that were slightly strange about, you know, where does Monroe Territor end? And can you draw it for me? You know, where, where is that? Um, and the... Uh, there's a way in which there is very strong, I mean, it's a strong sense of, of um, political boundaries of the panchaya, and those sorts of maps are really important. They're important in politics. They're important in the way people understand where they are and who they're within. Um, and that's, that's that sort of um, Cartesian view that's from above. It's that very defined line. Um, but then when you're trying to get around the village, when you're trying to ask someone, you, no one knows... Um, how to navigate it from an idea from above. You, you ask, you start circulating it. You navigate through doing, you don't navigate through um, a map. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And I, I, when I was first there working with um, one of the guys that does boat, the boat tours for the tourists, I was on his boat and I had some um, satellite images and I was asking about how I got to here and how I got to there. And, you know, um, Rajesh is a very... And, you know, we're educated, art he's an articulate, intelligent man. And he was like, you know, just, just tell me whose house I'm going to and then I can get you there. It's just not the way that the, that the village works that way. And in part, it's because it changes a lot. It, it changes really quickly. 
um, not, not just seasonally because of monsoon, but because of different activities, different land is remade and taken back. So it doesn't make a lot of, of sense to think about it in that mapping way. Was there any culture of, peop of drawing their environments, though? I mean, sort of locally, do people map things? Or is it really just maps relating to sort of to power? And well, this is, um, I suppose it's not, uh, I mean, Ashton Moody Estuary, a lot, a lot of the people that work in the village, you know, are working in the city, are working in universities, you know, they come back to the village as like a second home. It's not, it's not that it's a very different culture. You know, these people are, all the people I work with are completely comfortable with all the visual cultures that I engage with as well. But just in terms of the way that you, that people navigate and move through the village, I could say that, but I couldn't say that, I couldn't say anything more definite. There wasn't anything stark there. It's not, it's not that difference. It's just um, things on the edges of things that were there. And people would draw me pictures of the village. And, and um, you know, in the same way I had trouble drawing the edge of the village, they did as well. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess, yeah. So this is just a short question for Ivor. I was curious, Ivor, in your work, how you would um, attempt to conceptualize the distinction between the spectrum that you've invoked a couple of times between, between sort of solid matter and fluid matter, vis-a-vis -vis the kind the ways in which water becomes a site of where um, political violence bodies in your various case studies are being thrown into water systems as a means to hide the crime, which one, uh, I guess I'm wondering, like the body has a certain kind of like, at the moment of its um, forced disappearance into the water, still it maintains a certain discretion and over time that body would start to break apart, mm -hmm. I realize, and become much more continuous with this sort of spectrum, but mm -hmm. the political violence that you're invoking is a kind of, I don't know, I, I, I would wonder whether the attempt to somehow uh, bring that into intelligibility uh, would be troubled by the idea of this sort of, uh, the, the notion of dispersal, or mm. maybe you can just talk about how these two, the solid and the sort of liquefaction mm. is working in your conceptual mm. argument vis-a-vis -vis the question of political violence. Yeah, well, um, I think in relationship that um, the body takes a long time to disperse and decompose in watery space, depending on the watery space it is between fresh water and salt water. But, um, it, I mean, it can take millions of years. But whether it can be sensed or not, this is more about kind of a knowledge of its still existence there. Agree, yeah. I mean, I think there is a conceptual bridge that I need to... I need to somehow kind of um, produce here, but um, I'm I'm interested in the way in the way that 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 form of political violence is then entangled with other forms of political or or particulate violence, so such as the the the, pollu the pollution of the river. So you, you're you're putting all of these different forms of of um, socially or culturally constructed sort of othering, so the, the, the body of the political other, the body of, or, or so the material of the kind of, the material other, the pollutant, put all put into this watery space, and how then this kind of produces, produces a space in which these things are read together as a kind of, as a, as, as a, as um, in conversation and not, or, and as we know, in many ways, how they are in conversation, or they come from similar roots or similar sources, these forms of violence, or are enacted and produced against different... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling there, but um, yeah, certainly it's a question I need to address slightly better. <laughs> um, yeah. I, um, thank you for all the presentations. I thought they were um, very, very thought-provoking. Um, I think it's really interesting also to have um, these three presentations um, in this space in a school of architecture, um, essentially. Um, and I think it's a, a, a real uh, challenge. I, I think some of the questions that have been, I, I think I can spot the architects in the room in terms of the questions that have been asked. Um, the, a lot of the presentations that 
Um, my, my kind of research perspective is coming from um, looking at African cities in particular, um, Lagos, um, and, um, but I'm thinking of Simone um, and how he describes um, people as infrastructure and the way um, these, uh, th these assemblages have been described is um, similar to how Simone speaks about um, uh, the, the provisionality, um, the changeability, you know, the city takes form, comes into being through these um, ever changeable interactions. And that's a serious problem for architecture because it's constantly moving, it's constantly changing. And we're, uh, I'm, I'm now speaking <laughs> from my, my perspective as an architect as well, we're, we're, we like fixed things. You know, so I think it's really great as kind of a challenge to to this event, maybe. Um, and I think it's also a method methodological um, challenge for for the profession of architecture. Um, how do you um, engage? W how do we engage with when we're designing with that kind of provisionality without um, stratifying things or categorizing them and and sort of killing them, you know. Um, so yeah, that's that's my question. I don't know if we can answer it right now. I'm not an architect. We are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sort of yeah. Of, yeah. Thank you for that but comment. Though it's really yeah. interesting. Um, we're sort of out of time, but uh, yeah, uh, all to coffee now, and back at <coughs> back in about twenty minutes. Um, but thank you, you for um, Pamela and Jesse for three really, really interesting papers uh, from Submerged Imaginaries. And we end with a comment at the end of distinction. So, yeah, the end of distinction. So, yeah, thank you.